Good morning. Hello. Well, over the years, uh, I've developed a bit of a fascination with paradoxes. I don't know if you're familiar, but paradoxes are basically, they're these statements that are um, contradictory or have like incompatible elements to them. But when you take a closer look, uh, they reveal a hidden or unexpected truth. So an example, uh, less is more. Now, my friend uh, Kirk Morgan, he would say that is wrong. Less is always less. Um, but the hidden truth in that is um, that a lesser quantity can um, lead to greater effectiveness or have greater value. So at first glance, less is more seems contradictory. Um, less is always less. But if you look at it closer, there's a, there's a hidden gem there. Um, some other examples. How about this guy, the smartphone? Um, it actually represents and embodies a fascinating paradox of connection. So on the one hand, the phone represents incredible connectivity, right? At our fingertips, we have available to us the ability to connect with anyone across the globe. Uh, we have access to like ridiculous amounts of information. Um, there's just, there's so much that this phone does. Like, I don't know if I could live without it managing my schedule and all of those things. On the other hand, our little friend um, can lead to profound disconnection. How many of you have gone to dinner and seen a family of four, let's say, every head buried in their phone? Oblivious to the potential you know, conversations, or maybe intentionally escaping them, I don't know, um, and the human interaction that's available to them. So instead of deepening relationships, these devices can create barriers that isolate us in a digital world, which is often filled with superficial interactions. A couple more for you. What about uh, letting go to hold on? You know, sometimes in a relationship, we like try to hold on so tightly that it just messes everything up, right? You're smothering the other person. And it's often by letting go and giving space that we build stronger, more secure connections. So we, we hold on to relationships by letting go. Um, another one, the paradox of strength in vulnerability. So showing our vulnerability is often viewed as weakness. Like I kind of picked up on that just growing up. And um, there's great strength though in being vulnerable. It, it, it quickens authenticity. It fosters it. it. It builds deeper connections. It allows for both growth and resilience. So vulnerability looks like the opposite of strength, but um, it takes an incredibly strong person to be comfortable with their weaknesses. Now, part of my growing fascination with paradoxes is that the scriptures are just filled with these paradoxical statements, concepts, and truths. You know, for example, Jesus says, whoever wants their life or whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Or whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. Paul says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Other concepts like living through dying Gaining wealth by giving it away. The humble being exalted. The Bible is just filled with these apparent contradictions that possess really important spiritual truths. And the more I study the scriptures, the more I'm just in awe of who God is 
and just the, the complexity by which he has created this world that, that we live in. That, that things that seem so obvious to us are actually incongruent with Jesus and his teachings. Things that seem like obvious limitations for us are not beyond the ability of the Almighty. And so we see this all throughout the scriptures, and one of the places that it is most evident is the first advent. Jesus Christ, born humbly in a manger, Emmanuel, God with us. And so we're going to take the next several weeks and just unpack and, and look at some of these, these paradoxes, these these complexities, these things that don't seem to fit together within the Christmas story. And so I want to start by reading to you the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2, which says this, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened with the, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So can you see any paradoxes within the passage? I actually see a few, so I'm gonna I want to point them out to you. Um, first one is majesty in a manger. You're the king of the universe being born into humble beginnings in a stable. Second one, fear that leads to joy. You know, the shepherds, they were terrified when they saw the angel. But the message of this born Messiah brought them joy. The, that the last shall be first. The, the first to hear the good news of Jesus' birth were shepherds, but they were really the last in society. And the, the fourth one, peace amongst occupation. The angels proclaim peace on earth at a time where Israel is living under Roman oppression. So, I'm going to do a little audience participation here. You guys ready? Yeah, I don't know if you're ready. Okay, we're going to do it anyways. Maybe it'll wake up in the process. Um, all right, I want you to guess <clears throat> which topic we'll be talking about today. So we're just going to go through them. Just real simple. Throw your hands up. You go, you know what? I think it's this one, okay? Um, there's no real point to this. I just like competition. It's fun. All right. Majesty in a manger. Anyone? Show your hands. Majesty in a manger. A few hands there, okay. Um, fear that leads to joy. Okay, a couple hands, a couple hands here. Um, the last shall be first, anyone? Okay, a few more hands on that, okay. Peace amidst occupation. Mm, okay, all right. Very interesting. Um, I'm not going to tell you which one yet, but I am going to tell you a story. So, uh, my family, we're in the, like, Christmas watching mood. Anybody with me? Like, you've started to watch the Christmas movies? Yeah. Um, so, kind of our tradition is every, every year after Thanksgiving, because we're not crazy, we put our Christmas tree up. And um, as we do it, we watch 
Elf. It's like my favorite Christmas movie. Smiling's my favorite. And singing is like talking, but it's just longer and louder. And all sorts of great things. Anyways, um, so we watch Elf. And then more recently, um, my sons and I, we watched National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. A couple little fast forwards, but um, a lot of fun, a lot of fun, a lot of giggling. And then last year, we watched Deck the Halls. Anyone seen Deck the Halls? It's a lesser known, lesser known movie. Okay. Um, so, spoiler alert, the movie's from 2006, though. So, I mean, if you haven't seen it by now, that's on you, not on me. Um, but you've got Steve Finch, who's played by Matthew Broderick. Okay. And his, um, he's like a quiet, like optometrist type. He lives like a real orderly life, you know, nothing crazy. But his world gets turned upside down when car salesman Buddy Hall, played by Danny DeVito, moves into the neighborhood. Now, Buddy, he wants fame, he wants recognition, and so he becomes like obsessed with this idea of, I'm gonna set up the most ornate, crazy Christmas light celebration at my home, and you're gonna be able to see it from space. Now, he starts decorating, he starts getting really into it. Steve sees this and he starts feeling threatened because he currently holds the title of town Christmas guy. Now, what begins as a mild annoyance, it, it, it really quickly escalates into like a crazy rivalry. You know, Steve and Buddy, they're in this, this crazy battle to outdo each other. Um, each guy trying to claim the title of best Christmas decorations or display at their home. As you would expect in a movie like this, it gets a little out of control. Both the families even get caught up into it. They're like stealing each other's lights. They're sabotaging. Uh, it's crazy what, what all they do to, to best each other. Their obsessive focus on being number one overshadows the spirit of Christmas. Who would have thought? And in the end, the characters are reminded that Christmas isn't about being seen from space. Uh, it's not about having the most lights or the best decorations. Christmas is about community, family, and the joy of being together. Noticeably, noticeably absent is Jesus, but that's another thing. So, Based on the story, let me give you another shot at it. Just kind of call out. What do you think? Which, bring those up again. Which, which one are we going to do? Oh, people are scared. They're not sure. This is, ah, oh, here's some last shall be first. That is correct. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Good job. Picture this. In the stillness of a Bethlehem night, under a starlit sky, the first announcement of the birth of Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. It doesn't happen in a royal court. It doesn't happen in a religious temple. It happens in a field to a group of shepherds. Now, to truly grasp the weight of this, we need to understand that the, the shepherd's place in society at that time like shepherds were considered low, 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 disregarded. They lived on the fringes of society. Their work was humble, uncelebrated, a little stinky. Um, you know, they're the most unlikely candidates to receive the most significant news in all of history. Like, why would God choose to reveal the birth of the Savior, the, the King of Kings, to shepherds first. Th this wasn't a random choice. Th this was a deliberate act that spoke volumes about the nature of God and the nature of his kingdom. It, it was a declaration that, that the kingdom of heaven, in that kingdom, the last are first. The humble are exalted, and the meek inherit the earth. This moment with the shepherds, it shatters our preconceptions about worthiness, honor, and value. 
It, it invites us to see the world and God's plans through a different lens, a, a lens where the overlooked are seen, the undervalued are esteemed, and where true greatness lies not in power or prestige, but in humility and anonymity. And Jesus, he, he articulates this so clearly in Matthew chapter 20. So it's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Now I'm going to give you like a, a modern take on this well-known parable. So picture this, you've got a business owner who needs help with a project. So he hops on like Upwork or Fiverr, you know, one of those websites where you, you can hire people to do specific tasks for you. He hires someone on Monday to help him with his project. Very quickly, though, he realizes we're not going to meet this Friday deadline if it's just me and this other guy I hired. So he hires someone else on Tuesday. Uh, approaching the deadline, but still not on track, he hires a third person on Thursday. In the group text on Friday, he reminds everyone that their payment will be $3,000 for their work, something that they agreed upon individually before they started. So the guy hired on Monday, $3,000. The, the guy hired on Tuesday, $3,000. The guy hired on Thursday, you guessed it, yes, $3,000. Well, Mr. Monday, he's like, what the heck? I've been working on this project all week and this joker shows up on Thursday and he's getting the same amount as me? Well, the owner responds like, bro, I'm not being unfair. Like, didn't we agree on your payment before you started? Take your pay and move on. Like, I want to give the ones I hired later the same that I gave you. Don't I have the right to do whatever with my money? Are you mad because I'm generous? And then Jesus, he finishes this story with a statement. It's not a command. It's not really even an instruction. It's really just a truth. Jesus says in verse 16, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Like so counterintuitive. Aren't the last always last? Jesus says no. Can you put yourself in the shoes of Mr. Monday? I, I, th I think we all can do that, right? As you look at it, this doesn't sound very fair. But the reality is if we were Mr. Thursday, we would have no issue with the generosity of Jesus. So perhaps it's not our sense of fairness that's being violated as Mr. Monday, but it's our sense of self. You know, I've found that the hardest part of following Jesus is you. The hardest part of, of discipleship is, is me. There, there, there's this fundamental sense of self that runs so counter to the teachings of Jesus, a, a desire to promote myself, to, to make myself known, to be first. I mean, even the disciples, they're found arguing over who's going to get to sit next to Jesus in his kingdom. Yet Jesus invites us to be first by being last. To be the greatest by being the servant. He says in Matthew 16, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Another paradox, right? Saving your life by, by losing it. It sounds very much like being first by being last. Now, when we talk about the, the self in modern society, like what do you think of the self? Here, here's what I often think of about the self. This is the self. It's the selfie. Yeah. Do you guys remember this picture at all? 
It's the 2014 Oscars. Man, that was a long time ago. Um, remember when people watch the Oscars, not just like because they want to see who's getting slapped, but like they actually watched? Um, well, at this time, this was the most shared selfie in the history of Twitter, or X now. Um, over 3.4 3 million retweets and 2.4 million likes. And do you know what's ironic about this famous selfie? Like, is an ad for a Galaxy phone. Now, I feel like the phone's getting a bad rap today, don't you? But, you know, hey, since we're at it, let's, let's keep going. Now, did you know the average American touches their phone each day 2,617 times? Let that sink in. 2,617 times a day. And let's be honest, like you're not just checking your email. Most of it is carefully curated, reinforcing stream of the self. Take social media, okay? You are in total control. I mean, you have like godlike powers. You unfollow someone, poof, they're gone. It's like they cease to exist, right? Enough of your insignificance and critical comments. I'm done with you. Be gone. Boop. Unfollow. They just disappear. And you might like bump into them years later and it's like, oh yeah, I forgot you actually existed. There's so much power. It's like thousands of times a day, a constantly reinforcing mechanism about the self. And you don't think it impacts you? But what if 2,600 times a day you said a verse of scripture? Would that impact you? 2,600 times a day, the Lord is my shepherd. Wouldn't that get into your soul? 2,600 times a day, God so loved the world that he gave his son. Do you think we would be different? Of course we would. But in contrast, we get 2,600 instances that reinforce how central I am to the world rather than the centrality of God. So I want to go touch philosophical. I like to do this every now and again. And to be completely clear, like I'm an amateur at this, um, but I think it's really helpful because it gives us a window into where we are culturally speaking, but also how we got there. And to be clear, I'm not here to blame you with your obsession with yourself. Like I'm right there with you. I'm pretty great. Um, but what I do want to do is I want to expose how you've been manipulated to believe that this is the best way to live. Now, most of this derives from Charles Taylor. He's a, an amazing Catholic sociologist and philosopher. So according to Taylor, the quest for identity is really only a few hundred years old. You know, cavemen weren't walking around considering what is a self. Um, but when it first came to be a conversation, you had what was considered an honor society, where all society is driven by the idea of honor. Honor is the highest virtue. It's the greatest good in, in this society. And so basically, you would sacrifice anything personally in your life in honor or in order to achieve honor within the culture. So for women, this was primarily uh, revolved around making children. And the idea of a woman having a career or, or choosing that at the expense of, of having or, or raising children was shameful. And we've come a long way in that regard. For men, this was about heroic battle. You know, the ability to, to defend, to fight, to die for the sake of the community. Now, honor was the filter through which people made decisions and where society would either reward or punish you. 
after this vision of honor, historically speaking, the, the next one became basically about moral absolutes. Um, it's sort of the Greco realm of, of thought. It's a lot of Plato's ideas. You know, we know that there are absolutes out there, these pure forms. And it's our job to restrain our impulses to contemplate and achieve them. So if you take the four cardinal virtues, you know, justice, wisdom, self-restraint, and courage, and you take these, these cardinal virtues, they, they were the measuring stick by which your life was respected. It was the degree to which you could repress your disordered desires and live out these virtues. And there was a group of cultural elites that would either, they would give you validation or uh, the opposite based on how well you ordered your life around these virtues. And so this is uh, the traditional self. It's, it's an external communal oriented sense of self where it's your job to sacrifice for the good of others, the, the community, your family, and so on. Now, something happened around the 1700s that, that shifted people's mindset from um, the ideal values to live up to, to internal desires to live out. And it happened slowly through the rise of, of rationalism, the, the scientific method. This is all during the Enlightenment. Um, but instead of philosophy, it boiled down to reason. It's where you get Descartes and in his statement, I think, therefore I am. It's all about the ability to comprehend through the mind. Next was the Romanticists under Rousseau. And this was uh, relying really on the feelings of the heart. It's, it's not about philosophy, but it's about beauty, art, aesthetics. And so they basic, basically believed that human beings are fundamentally good, but that society has corrupted us. And so what you have to do is you have to go into the goodness of your heart and then live that out to fix Society. Um, now, if you understand the Bible's teachings on the heart, you know why this is a problem, right? The, the heart is deceitful, it's broken, and so on. All right, fast forward a little bit. Somewhere in the 20th century, an epoch-shaping shift happened. We're not entirely sure why, but it was the idea that there are no external truths that you have to live up to. It's all internal. And anyone who is saying that there's an external reality that you must conform to has a power goal of oppressing you. Therefore, the goal of life is not to suppress your desires and conform to external standards. The goal of life is to reject all the external standards so that you can express all of your internal desires. So the only sense of self is the heroic self that, that throws off the external and makes humanity and reality a blank canvas for authentic expression. And Taylor calls this the age of authenticity. So this says that each person has their own way of realizing and achieving their own ethical and moral vision for the world. That nobody has the right to tell anyone else what is right or what they should do with their lives. That each person has to go inward to their deepest desires and share the world, share with the world the result of that. These internal desires demand recognition from our culture. So, in previous generations, right, you had to sacrifice for your culture. But in this modern sense of self, the culture has to sacrifice for you and for your desires. So rather than putting others first, others must put you first. 
Now this obviously flies in the face of, of what Jesus is teaching, that the, the last will be first and the, and the first will be last. This is like the world applying Kirk's logic, right? That less is always less. This is the world saying like, the first is always first. And the only way that you can be first is if you throw off anything and everything that is keeping you from your desires. This is what Taylor calls the idea of the buffered self. Buffered self. Um, it's, it's that where we once, like communally, believed that there was a God. That there was an openness to divine influence where we believed we could encounter the divine through prayer and through worship. But the modern self views any intervention as oppression. So it shuts itself off from any external realities or spiritualities. This is the buffered self. It's explicitly anti-religion because religion is a form of oppression. Unless you resonate with like personal parts of it and you can kind of take it in and authenticate it for yourself. So we've shifted from duty to desire from sacrificing for others to others sacrificing for us, from, from putting others first to putting ourselves or me first. Now, uh, there are obvious critiques that we can give about the former senses of self. Um, they're, they're out there and they're real. But that is not the problem that you are dealing with. I, I think it's part of how we got here. And I think there's value in looking at that, but, but that's not the self that you are struggling with or we are struggling with. So again, you know, the goal today is not to shame you, but it's to show you you've been sold something that is counter to the way of Jesus. Jesus did far more than tell us that the last will be first. Like he lived it. He chose disciples that no one else would choose, and he elevated them. He washed their feet. He served them. He ate with sinners, like literally the last in religious circles. He, he elevated women and children, the last in power dynamics. He, he came to us, children of the Father, while we were still enemies with God, he came to us and he announced his arrival first to the last of us. The last of the last. The lowest of the low. The shepherds. Jesus embodied this reality that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And he invites us to embrace lastness with him. He exalts the humble. He esteems the low. And he makes the first last. And his invitation is to embrace lastness so that you can experience what it's truly like to be first. You didn't have to assert it. You didn't have to force it. But instead, God lifts you up. And it's that full an abundant life that Jesus promises. And it's realized, at least in part, by embracing lastness. So what do you need to do to embrace lastness? You know, I often find myself just sitting through a message and just kind of asking, like, what does this message require of me? You know, if, if you're not following Jesus, um, that might be exactly what you need to do to recognize how you got here, to embrace humility, to embrace this external God and allow him to show you what it looks like to truly be first, to, to reorient your life around this God and allow him to reshape you. For those of us that, that are following Jesus, like, what do you need to do to embrace lastness? Honestly, I can't 
imagine that there's a single person in this room who's been paying any sort of attention today thinking absolutely nothing. Like, I'm pretty great at being last. I do it all the time. I'm wonderful at it. Nothing needs to change. I think that if we're listening, there's something that the Holy Spirit is saying to each of us. And it's unique to you, to your situation, to where you are in life. And for some, like the work that needs to be done is profound. And that's okay. Like you've been sold something your entire life that's not the way of Jesus. And it is going to take time. It is going to take work to reorient your life around his way, but it is so worth it. For some, it's, it's much more subtle, it's much more incremental, but it requires just asking God, what do I need to do to embrace lastness? Where are the spaces that I'm putting myself first? Where are the spaces where I'm self-promoting? The places where I'm placing myself above you and allowing the Spirit to speak to you clearly and the ability to listen and respond. What do you need to do to embrace lastness? God came to make the last first. That's, that's what Jesus did. He, he came to make us first. I mean, he sees us. He sees you. All your imperfections, all the things that, that you sit alone and think, if anyone ever knew this about me, he sees that. The worst thing that you've ever done, he sees that the darkest places in your heart that you wish you could just stop being that way or stop thinking that way. He sees that. And he came for you. That you might know what it is to be first. If you just allow him to be the one to elevate you there. So I want to encourage you, whatever the Spirit is saying to you, whatever is happening in in your heart, I want to encourage you to respond to that. I want to encourage you to to listen to that. And I want to encourage you to, to pray about that. We have some folks who are going to come forward in just a moment, and they would love the opportunity to pray with you. Like Seriously, it's the highlight of their week to sit and go to the Father with someone else. And so we invite you to to respond in that way. We invite you to respond in, in praise and worship to the God who sees you and came for you to put you first. Would you pray with me? Jesus, And we're so grateful that you see us. Sometimes maybe we wish you didn't see all of us. There are certainly things I would love to to keep from you. But what is so powerful is that you see all of it and you still came. You see all of it and you extend grace, forgiveness, love. You invite us to be a part of your family. What a gift, a gift that no one else is offering. So Jesus, we ask that we would just be able to not only be grateful for what you've done, but that we too can embody it, that we too can embrace being last we can see the people around us 
serve them, love them the way that you do. Jesus, we thank you. And it's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen.